David, why don't you take it away? All right, I have the chat uh, window open, so if anything comes through uh, that's urgent, we'll see it going by. Um, I, I don't exactly know how to begin. I became aware of the high quality of Grateful Dead audio when I attended an event called the uh, Sound Test at the Cow Palace on March 23rd of 1974. I've been going to see the dead since 1972, but it, but it wasn't until that event and a column by John L. Wasserman that, that the public began to become aware of the depth of the Grateful Dead's commitment to good audio. That was kind of the public manifestation of it. Wasserman wrote a column in the Chronicle called, Shh, the Grateful Dead are playing. And it was, it, it included some uh, uh, discussion with uh, various technicians about why it was possible, how it was possible for the Grateful Dead to put up, you know, 200 speakers uh, and perform at full volume and you could still have a conversation uh, elsewhere in the building. The point was that it was clear, clean sound, not overpowering SPL among other things. So that began my awareness of what they were doing. And then over time, as I drifted into journalism, being a musician and a journalist uh, put me in a position to sort of start doing technical type stuff. And I started writing for Mix Magazine and uh, eventually got um, into contact with John Meyer and started learning about how speaker technology and stuff works. I did a, I did a big long interview with John either, for, I think it might've been for REP back in the day. So I, I, I am a musician who became aware of and became a great appreciator of this technology, but I don't really know jack shit about it. So um, let's begin by you describing what it is about that sound system that make, made it so important and, and how it began this process of, um, or, or how it led to so many great developments. You're asking me? You're the subject of the interview. <laughs> right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I, get, I conf get confused sometimes. Well, anyway, I happen to be at the same event as you in 1974. I was actually living in Switzerland with John Meyer as well. We were working, we had our own laboratory there. We were just establishing it. Uh, and, uh, the, um, but I had come in and, uh, I went to the cow palace to see the, the, the structure because it, it's, it got developed while I was away to a certain degree. I left in uh, early January, uh, from the Bay area. And so in January uh, 74. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this was the culmination of several years of work in your name. Well, of course it was, time. but I, I left, I left, well, I got a, a better gig and. <laughs> Switzerland. I mean, uh, John Meyer got it for me, actually. And uh, Meyer and I went to Switzerland to uh, build a recording studio is what we were really originally there for. And uh, we, um, uh, we went, uh, and I, I came back periodically to the California. I kept the house here. And uh, I had to come back because uh, I had my car parked in front of the house. And once in a while, you got to move it. And uh, this and that and the other. And so I, I flew back and forth from Switzerland all the time and um, on the company's um, you know, budget that, you know, they paid. So, um, but I was at that same event as you. Um, and um, because, but that was a culmination of several years of work. And uh, I came back in the late 1972 and I was, um, uh, asked by Ron Wickersham, who was one of the uh, 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 original people uh, with Alembic. And Alembic was part of the Bears, uh, let's say fiefdom, you know, he, he sort of ran as like a quasi manager recording engineer for the Grateful Dead, as well as uh, he established Alembic to be their technical support team. And Alembic, um, uh, I had worked at Alembic before, uh, but then I was let go from Alembic. Uh, and then uh, I, I did other things, uh, rock film and other things. And then I came back from Europe and I was, you know, I didn't have a job. So Ron said, uh, Ron Wickersham, 
So John, uh, you know, we're going to start this. Uh, Vera wants to do a, a new sound system. And, uh, and we have some new ideas on how to do it. And uh, I'd work with the old sound system for a couple of, about a year, you know, literally uh, kind of quasi roadieing it, you know, going to the show and setting it up and taking it out on, on the road and all. So I knew what the old system was. And uh, the old system was very conventional at the time. You know, the usual microphones, which are directional mics and the speakers on each side and all that. And then Bear had this idea that the people that uh, the band itself needed a lot of its own sound more than um, they usually can get from these little uh, fold back uh, kind of um, uh, speakers that often sit on the stage. So he said, you know what, we could put all the sound behind this, the, 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 the band, but then would of course have uh, a problem with feedback because you know that's the hooting and hissling, hissing or the you know the overloads that you hear when you turn the sound up too much uh, with a normal uh, with a speaker that's aimed at the at the microphone. And so we had it. We went to this differential mic business, which are two identi virtually identical microphones. One is out of phase with the other. Right now, Bear yeah. told me that he learned that from the helicopter work uh, when he was in the service. That well, that's was... possible that he was the first guy to do that. He was the guy, first guy to tell me. He told me something about maybe he told the uh, guys from the airplane or something, uh, Jefferson Airplane. He may have told them about it, and because I remember him them being mentioned, but I never talked to them, so I only talked to Bear. So uh, Bear, we we decided to. Um, well, what the heck, if we were going to do it, we might as well get decent microphones. And um, we got these Bulin Care microphones that are these measurement standard microphones. They're very, very accurate. And um, we thought, well, what the heck, we might as well get the best and, uh, and get matched, you know, get a mat. So that when the microphones are literally seeing the same sound, they basically cancel each other out. Right. Because that's how it would work. You see, you, you, you only sang into one microphone. Yeah. And the other microphone was like below, not, a, not, not left and right, but above and below. Yes, I saw below them many times yeah. and I watched the poor hapless saxophonist of Commander Cody and his Lost Planet Airmen trying to get the bell of his instrument around one of those pickups and <laughs> the other at the I'm Hollywood worse. <laughs> it, it was a tough gig for him. <laughs> well, I, I, I've seen uh, other people, guest stars, who didn't know what they were doing. And they'd be playing a harmonica or something between the two. And, and it was like they'd be canceling themselves right in the middle, you know. And it was absurd uh, from, from uh, you know, maybe on the stage they couldn't tell. But boy, boy, I tell you, you could sure tell out in the audience. Let's back up just a little bit, because the, the philosophy of this system it was was also novel for the setting. The idea that each instrument would have its own system, which Dan Healy characterized as the ultimate IM elimination system. But, you know, as a practical matter, it would take a guy of Bear's massive ego and intellect to envision a system that costly and think that it could be made practical. But where, where did the idea of each instrument having its own system come into play and, and be deemed viable? Well, before, before uh, actually, even uh, before the wall of sound, actually each instrument did have its own sound. In other words, you know, with a real uh, band, uh, like uh, that has to do concerts, you know, with, with reasonable numbers of people, you almost invariably, everybody's got to have their own amplification. You know, whether it's just a, a Fender, you know, amp, you know, or uh, whatever you want to use, some vacuum tube driven, uh, 100 watt per channel amp or something like that. So all they did was expand beyond that. Now, a lot of the time, some groups, you know, will use the main PA as part of their instrument extension. So if you put that into the, like the sound of the bass guitar and, the, and, uh, and even all the rest of the instruments, literally plug them into the main PA, well, then it intermodulates with the voices. That's it's just normal, normal mixing 
it's just trying to keep the mixing down to a minimum between the different instruments and the different voices. So the whole idea was that, uh, but it, it was always that way in a way. I mean, as far as I recall, well, it wasn't I, I, that I understand much what you're saying, but in a place like the Fillmore Auditorium, you could you could maybe make a hundred watt amplifier reach the back of the room. But as soon as you get into bigger buildings, you had to have sound reinforcement systems, which were shoving everything through the same mixer and, and out into the PA. And that's why that that's why the idea of uh, large scale uh, separate systems was so uh, novel, right? Well, yeah. Well, they kept growing. You know, the Grateful Dead were used to very small groups when I first <laughs> yeah. heard the Dead. I mean, they were. You know, I heard them uh, at a gymnasium. You know, at Berkeley Cap in Berkeley campus. I mean, it was pretty small group comparatively speaking. Yeah. And um, then there, of course, the Fillmore. And uh, but they kept getting bigger and bigger gigs, and that's one of the reasons they brought me in and brought others in, because they, they said, well, we're going to do two thousand people or something. What are we going to do? They did the Berkeley Community Theater one time. Um, that's thirty five hundred seats, and that's where I sat. But that was my the second, third, fourth, and fifth shows were that venue. I in August of 72 and that's a that's right there that's already at that scale you're you're too big for just using your stage amps so you have to use sound reinforcement systems and that brings me back to the question of whoever thought it was possible to make you know a, a single speaker stack for your instrument that you could play a stadium with well it was just multiplying it up you know i mean it wasn't a big uh, uh to me, it wasn't a big departure. Uh, I was actually at those. Uh, I don't remember exactly what month, whether it was the next time after you saw the, the event uh, at the Berkeley Community Theater. But when I came back, my first gig with the dead, with the dead, was dead, was dead, was with the people. And so what I did is I tested, they were using horns at the time. Uh, J all JBL, they used JBL big direct radiator woofers and they had the cabinets and all pretty much figured out in those days. But they, they had these horns for the thousand cycles and up or so. And what happened was is that the distortion coming out of these horns was so high that it was always distorted. It didn't really matter, you know, just playing the music in general, it was three to 10% distortion all the time. Jesus. And I measured it to Jesus. prove that. And I said, we can't use horns like this. And they, they got loud enough, but they, they, they got loud with distortion. You see, when they designed the horns in the old days, back in the home, I mean, not home theater, the, the movie theater days, they had little tiny driver uh, things and little tiny spe uh, speaker uh, amplifiers, you know, 10 watts, 15 watts, 25 was pretty high. Uh, you know, back in 1935 or 40 or 45, when they had des originally designed these horns. So the drivers themselves, the ones that sit on the back, the thing that really moves the air, they were really low power. So when they designed the whole horn, they didn't, it didn't work too badly because the driver could never put out enough acoustical SPL to make the horn really, really, squeeze the sound too much. And so it worked fine for 1945 to 1955 or something. But then by that time we were doing it, these horns were being used with bigger and bigger drivers. So they'd start off with, used to be a 10 watt driver. And then, you know, it's just a mounting in the back of the horn. The horn is just a passive thing. And then you put this, this thing, it looks like a little miniature speaker. And then they, they, they made them like 25 watts and then 50 watts and then 100 watts. And they were putting more and more energy into the horn, but not changing the horn contour because it worked just fine in 1945. Why should they change it now? Well, the, the, I, we caught them at it. So when I showed the JBL guys this, they, they acted like, what hole did I come out of? <laughs> because they didn't want to tell anybody that stuff. I said, guys, these things aren't working right. So we had to go to direct radiators. And that, Ron Wickersham and I were the guys that really did that kind of, that kind of uh, work. And we tested every kind of speaker that we could. 
especially for mid-range performance because we didn't know what we could get away with um, without using horns. Most everybody else was using horns for the mid-range. Everybody pretty much, they, they were bass bins. They were, uh, the, the British often used uh, 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 big uh, uh, horn-like bins, kind of like the big, kind of a, an improved Altec horn thing, you know? And, yeah, and, uh, but we, the Grateful Dead had gone to direct radiators, just lot stacks of them uh, long before we went to the Wall of Sound. Now, I also, yeah, recall, I also recall that. mentioning that he he uh, uh, visited the uh, JBL factory down in Southern California and, and tested stuff coming off the line and found that the performance from unit to unit was ridiculously inconsistent as well. I, I can believe that. Yeah, John used to be really, well, John and I worked together in the 60s of all things. We actually worked for the same company in Berkeley, but at different years, but we had the same position in life. Uh, I went back to school and he, John took over. Um, uh, and in fact, I actually went to work professionally and then John Amire took over. Uh, the, uh, we used to do uh, custom, uh, we used to use, sell Clipshorns and Macintosh and Marantz and stuff like that at a place called Berkeley Custom Electronics. So we come from there and, and we actually were inspired, he and I both were inspired by our boss who was an engineer himself. And his name was Joe Miner. And, and Joe had that vision of quality and doing the best. He had a dream. You know, it was kind of a drink, drinker's dream. You know what I mean? It was like, you sit there and say, what am I going to do to make the best possible whatever? And we used to sit around with a jug of wine and think about, you know, how to build a better loudspeaker and this and that and the other after hours. So uh, John Meyer went off and started acoustics and I started doing electronics. But we, we got from the same mentor. So it's even how do you how, how do you um, prototype a speaker? I mean, you can't build a speaker at home from the ground up, right? I mean, how do you do that sort of thing? Well, the Grateful Dead speakers were kind of wor worked out by cut and try, I think, more than anything. Uh, they used to use a JBL D150 uh, F. That's a Fender version of it. It was slightly stiffer suspension, and they seemed to work out okay for the the job. Of, oh, so uh, you were you were using existing uh, products, well, just trying to find the best ones and the best way to match them up. Well, in a way, uh, the the woofer stacks uh, or the stacks just got higher and higher with us. <laughs> they didn't. They 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 started off with maybe six or eight high. And then maybe we made them 32 high or something. You know what I mean? We, I don't know how high we really got them. Well, we got them pretty darn high. But the, that was just, see, that's called a vertical array. And the re reason, this was actually Ron Wickersham's idea. Ron Wickersham came from another background, whereas I, we, uh, John Meyer and I, for example, John didn't work for us, by the way, at the time. Um, he worked for McCune Sound System, which is a different sound system in the city. And... Uh, the, um, the vertical array comes from uh, antenna theory. In other words, uh, radio frequency antennas. You make a, a radio frequency antenna um, by uh, phasing it in a, such a way that you can actually give it directionality instead of just radiating in all directions. It'll give you more energy uh, like north and south if that's what you want, or east and west, by w how you place the antennas. Well, in our particular case, it, when you stack speakers like woofers on top of each other in a vertical array, you get like a very, very, very large woofer. In other words, it's not a 15 inch woofer, it's at 30, it's 45, it's 60, yeah. and on and on and on and on up. And it creates a different kind of wave from the, um, just a single speaker. It creates a syndrilical wave instead of a spherical wave. Now think about this, a point source, if you think of a point source and then you think about emitting the sound, it comes out everywhere, you know, like comes from a mm -hmm. source, let's say one direction and it goes out equally. But with a syndrilical wave, it comes out as a kind of a, a syndrilical kind of thing around 
the, the thing. And what that does is it compresses the um, off axis energy. So you don't get as much energy on the floor or the ceiling. You don't want the energy to be on the floor or the ceiling because it's just reverberation that only gets in your way. Right. So the whole idea behind a vertical stack, and besides it's darn convenient, you've only got a floor, you know, you got a floor space for one speaker, why not have floor space for 20? You know, the same floor space. Is your my understanding of that was that if you were standing close to it, you were hearing the lower ones. And as you got farther away, you heard more of the other drivers, but you weren't hearing the whole 32 foot stack if you were standing right next to it. And that was, that's that true was too. what makes it work, right? That's, that's what it did for the band itself. That We didn't want the whole band to hear the whole experience completely because it would be too much for them. So much of the time they would, they, the, the top, the stuff over the top of their head would not, would, they wouldn't really hear it. They'd only hear the portion that they were standing under, standing in front of. And that's good because, uh, you know, we didn't want it too loud. You know, I'm surprised that any of these guys could hear today, but they can. That's the amazing well, part. That that's arguable in some cases. I remember seeing it on June 8th of 74 at the Oakland Stadium. <clears throat> I remember starting the second set with my friends on the top of the third deck and walking down through the different tiers and listening to the show as we went down and eventually winding up right under Phil Lesh's nose uh, as he hit this big note in Wharf Rat. And, and the remarkable thing about it was that the sound was clear and even at all levels and in all locations. That was the magic of that system. Well, uh, you, that was what, in the 80s? No, 74, June of 74, the wall of sound. Oh, okay. Well, in, in Phil's system, I mean, he, he really did have the, the most stack, most of the stack, you know, he had the biggest stack. In town. I mean, after all, he was the bass player. And uh, he um, uh, even had, uh, uh, I think, uh, a, a, some version where he actually had what, different stacks had different uh, strings. He did. Stage. That's right. I remember seeing uh, in, in July of 74, uh, we got in early at Fresno and he was testing out his quad system. And he yeah. had like there were each two, his two main stacks, I guess, were split. So there were, he could send each string to one of four systems, uh, you know, to, to the left and right side of the stage. And we heard him try. Yeah, I, I think as a practical matter, it turned out to be a fairly limited utility. Because how often do you want to do, you know, you're going to want to take the time to bother doing spatial orientation in the middle of a jam. No, I agree. I, I was actually, remember, I, I was living in Switzerland for the most part. So I didn't go to these events. Uh, I saw the Grateful Dead. The next time I saw the Grateful Dead after spring uh, uh, at the Cow Palace was uh, in, the, in Ferris, of all places. And... Um, they wouldn't let me out of the uh, back area to hear the system, the, you know, the French police or whatever, the gendarmes, the, the people who ran, you know, ran the um, security, they wouldn't let me out from the back to hear what was going on. Well, I never did get to hear the system in Paris. Kind of huh? silly. But... Did, did you have a, I, I'm curious about the structure of the uh, organization that was developing this sound system, because it was a lot of different people and a lot of different business entities. Was there, did you have a formal role in the Grateful Dead sound system project? I did the electronics. But, but who, who was in charge of it all and how was it organized? Well, I think that Ron Wickersham is not given as much credit as he should. These days, he, he they, there was trouble with um, his wife. She was part of Olympic, and uh, the the he gained enemies. Let's just say, and, and to, even to this day, and uh, she she actually pilfered funds and did certain things she shouldn't have done. And um, the um, Ron was was stood behind his wife. Couldn't dare do anything else. And so even though when she was wrong, and so he kind of got blackballed from the group in a way. So he, after 
like 1975 or six, I don't think he was very often mentioned hmm. as part of the big deal, but he was one of the main people in, the, including Bear, of course, Bear was our final ultimate consultant. But we're, Ron and I did the work of the speaker uh, testing and, um, and selection. We found a, a little cone speaker. We, we kind of liked the idea of little cone speakers, little five inch cones, you know, but we don't, we didn't like the Bose ones. We, you know, they, we, we tried them, but they were pretty cheap. But at, JBL made a little tiny four or five inch cone, which is very efficient, had a replaceable cone, but we could actually, if they broke it, we could actually fix it very easily. And um, they weren't cheap. They were actually probably made for airports or something. But they were very efficient, and uh, we used them by the hundreds, you know, like literally made those arrays, and they worked out okay. They were pretty good little little speakers. They had real magnets on, in them and all. I remember seeing crew members swapping out speakers during the show at various times, climbing up on the scaffold and bringing out a, a, a little speaker. I, I guess, I, I, how would you even know which, which driver was broken in I an array? I have no idea. Because <laughs> there was that, that vocal cluster must have had like a hundred speakers in it. Oh, at least, yeah. <laughs> uh, the only horn that we used was um, a horn that was I had experimented with, um, which was from a different company than JBL, and that was Electro Voice. We found that that particular speaker above, let's say, uh, 3,500, 4,000 cycles, let's say 4,000 cycles, was actually better than uh, any of the other tweeters that we tried. Each tweeter had its own problems. The JBL tweeters had certain problems. Sometimes they'd have a resonance right in mid-band and uh, they really did have a sharp resonance. And sometimes uh, they had distortion, extra distortion. The, the Electro Voice tweeter uh, was ideal for this application. And Meyer and I actually took the same driver to Switzerland with us and we ordered them by the dozens and hundreds, you know, to build our own speaker systems. It's We're also system. living in a time right now of just ridiculously powerful tools, real-time measurement tools and stuff like that. You were working with a decidedly uh, uh, less evolved technology 40, 50 years ago. Let's talk about that a little bit. How did you, how were you able to monitor and verify and improve your stuff? Well, they did have they did have test equipment in those days. It was just less convenient to use. So instead of using an FFT machine that would give you an entire spectrum, we had two different versions. We had a real time analyzer, which was made by Altec actually, and that used third octave, you know, like a graph, you know, graphic equalizer, and it would do third octave bands. So in real time, you could see how it worked out. And then we had EQ networks that were both made by uh, Altec and they were passive. They were completely passive, but they were old styles, but they were really tight so that, that they were third octave too. And you could know with a third octave analyzer, you could, do, you could do a third octave adjustment so that you could get a flat that didn't make the sound necessarily perfect, but it, it did, did um, flatten the response and sometimes it would help especially in the old days with feedback where you had a normal system and it would just be too much gain in one particular frequency area uh Bulen care made some fairly sophisticated equipment at the time uh they made it like a 10th octave analyzer which is just a lot of, of eqs i mean just all you know just just a whole array of them and they, they charge a lot of money. But the, the stuff they use today is more convenient. But we could still measure the distortion, for example, We're just putting its test tone in and uh, measuring the distortion out of a speaker with a B and K mic or the equivalent thereof. Um, it was not that hard. It was just, we had to write it all down, you know, and in other words, we'd, we'd have a say 1,000 cycles and then we'd see the number and write it down. Then we'd 2,000 cycles and we'd you know, write it down. Then we'd make a little graph. We'd make our own little graphs. We, we actually had graph paper that had a, a 20 to 20,000 on the graph. 
and make it easy for us. And then we'd make our own graphs. And that's how it was done. It, it, was, it, it was almost the same sensitivity as today, as far as what we could see from an amplitude point of view. We didn't do phase in those days. Phase was considered, eh, who cares about phase? And that, that became more important later. Yeah, that's certainly when I started paying attention and learning about this stuff, one of the first things that John Meyer talked to me about was developing phase coherent EQ systems uh, that he talked about, you know, phase problems uh, it, it, that need to be addressed all the way through from start to finish, which I'm not sure I completely grasp, but I understand that phase is a big issue. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, what we call non-minimum phase too. Um, sometimes when you have what they call a minimum phase, and if you have a dip, there's a certain phase shift that's associated with a dip. But when you put a peak in, which is a non-minimum non um, phase kind of uh, EQ, uh, it actually equalizes everything out. When it's flat, the phase it's phase shift free for all practical purposes. But then there's non-minimum phase, and that's when you have exit. That's when you have like differences in speakers. Let's say you have a, a woofer and a tweeter and they're they're different spaces from each other you know one one the, tweeter leads the woofer you know yeah. you can't eq that very well you can't eq the eq the phase very well okay well this leads me to to my next question about all this stuff how uh, the the wall of sound became impractical for a great number of reasons not the least of which was the cost of trucking it around the country during the uh, first energy crisis. But when the dead came back from their hiatus in 76, they were using a conventional system where everything was fed through normal speakers. But by then the uh, speakers, speaker systems were a lot better, right? We had begun to see the technology that people like Meyer were bringing forth. Can we talk, can you talk about the transition back into more conventional PA systems? Well, I wasn't part of it, interestingly enough. Um, I uh, had an out with the Grateful Dead in Paris. And um, uh, the drummer, uh, Kreutzmann, decided to beat me up, or wanted to. And Jerry stopped him. And after that, I said, I'm not going to be treated like this. So I, I left. When I left um, the Hilton at that uh, morning, I never came back. Oh, but I had my uh, deal in Switzerland. John Meyer actually jumped on board later. And then he started making, offering them better sound to, because they had discontinued the wall of sound. John Meyer was around a little bit as a, not a paid consultant, but he was my friend. And we would talk about the problems of the wall of sound back in the seventies. But John wasn't part of it then. He was part of it after he let, came back in 1975. He came back from Europe and I stayed in Europe. So I, I, I actually stayed another year or more, year and a half. So um, when John came back, he, he probably looked them up and started working with them. Uh, and their conventional system, well, I don't know why they destroyed the system. I, I, I have a feeling it was uh, more childish whim than uh, than uh, anything rational to um, just let the set, well, the wall of sound disappear the well, way it, it did. There, there were a number of factors that I, I am aware of. Uh, one, I mean, they when they when they quit playing a, after that set of shows in October '74, there was some legitimate question as to whether they would ever tour again. And it really wasn't certain at that point. But I also was under the impression that they, they it, I, I don't think it was practical to, to, you know, just put it in the garage on the prospect of coming back again. But I think it was also the, the wall of sound was part of the reason for the band taking that hiatus. One, various people said various things like, there were certain people that they were hoping would wander off that they didn't have the nerve to, you know, send away. They were hoping some of those people would just kind of find something else to do and they could was bring one their of those steam guys. back together. Sorry, John. 
You think Sparky was one of those guys? I, I don't know any of the characters well enough to speculate about that sort of thing. But they, um, I mean, I think it stands to reason that they wouldn't just mothball that thing with the hope of bringing it back when they had no specific plan to ever bring it back. And then there was the matter of, do we really want to go out on the road again with a system that requires seven semi trucks or whatever it was and two stage assemblies? I mean, they when they went back to work, they they did the first tour they did in 76 was theaters. There was no way they were going to put the wall of sound into the Orpheum Theater. So I think it was uh, not practical to even consider putting the wall of sound back on tour. And by then, I think the technology had changed as well. Yes. Actually, I think they were uh, rather immature about it. OK, say more. Uh, because they had some really nice stuff that Bear had gotten them over the years that really sounded good, for example, the vacuum tube amplifiers that they used, uh, the 350, the Macintosh 350 uh, tube amplifiers, they were wonderful. And we wanted to get more of them for the wall of sound. We couldn't because they stopped making them. They switched over to solid state. So we had to use the solid state for most of the wall of sound, except for the tweeter. And uh, the tweeter array, we used the, the, the big tube units because they sounded better. And they had less crossover distortion and everything else. You know, they were really good amps. And I, I found that those amplifiers went out to different people to do different stupid things like, uh, oh, I don't know, um, a rumble shaker thing, you know, or something, some, some industrial application. They didn't have to do that. And uh, I never did find out. Somebody asked me this morning, where happened to the Grateful Dead microphones? I still don't know what happened to them. That's a good question. Huh. I mean, there were at least you know ten or more uh, really good Bueling Care microphones, and um, uh, at least the elements in their electronics. I, I'm guessing uh, that, you know that there at that time also there 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 probably wasn't a lot of money to spend on things like warehousing a gigantic sound system and stuff. So probably a lot of that stuff got liquidated out of financial necessity. Yeah. You know, again, they weren't sure they were ever going to play again as a band. Of course, they they continued working. They went right into the studio, and made one of their greatest records the following year. So you know, it wasn't like the Grateful Dead broke up. But there were some legitimate concerns about whether and how they would tour again, and 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 again, they, there wasn't a lot of money. They didn't become filthy rich until you know many many years later. I don't know. They were pretty rich when when they, the Wall of Sound was built on uh, the, the Grateful Dead's money that they were making on the tours, and uh, the, what I was told was that you know basically instead of having to pay taxes on a, a lot of the money, they were just spending it on the equipment. And it was basically a, almost like a trade-off, so uh, they could write it all off, you know, because they were making more and more money. I mean, gee, we did five hundred thousand people at Watkins Glen. I mean, it's not like we did. They didn't. They didn't. They weren't very successful. Uh, they were. They were touring in big places. It may have been expensive to do, and I think that there were. I was told there were problems with personnel. But I don't know what who, what personnel or whether there are added personnel that came on later. But you know, some of these guys are kind of scary. It's Tell true. It. You, know, you don't want to you don't want to mess with a roadie. Uh, you know, you don't want to piss him off. You know, I mean, it, it's like uh, it's not worth it. I I can but, tell you from personal experience that you don't even have to piss them off. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, various people at various times, you know. I, I was underfoot a lot at various times and considered underfoot at various times in various situations. And having one guy for a friend automatically made you the enemy of somebody else and things like that. So, you know, and then you add a lot of uh, 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 the wrong kind of drugs into the formula and personalities get distorted. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got some personal experience of that stuff. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, it, when I say immature at all, it's a lot of that is the stuff that that uh, you see it as non non adult what we normally consider adult behavior and uh, and a lot of power tripping you know and 
Well, I thought it was I thought it was joining a culture of really, really smart, creative people that wanted to do cool stuff together. And it was that, but it was also sitting on this infrastructure that was more or less a fucking pirate ship. <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. I never fit in very well, really. When I think about it now, I used to go on the road with them, but it was it was hard to go on the road because um, going on the road itself was hard, you know. But it's um, it's just I I didn't know the I wasn't wise enough, you know, street wise enough. I walk into difficult situations not realizing why I even got in this situation. They would situations would be created where I'd be like um, not allowed in a, an event when I actually had to run the event. I mean, stupid things like that. That's um, just somebody messing with you for the fun of it. That That's not limited to the Grateful Dead, but it definitely seemed to happen a lot in that world. Oh, yeah. Well, my worst one was with Bill Graham, of all people. And in fact, it happened that night of Berkeley Community Theater in 1974. I had all, i am always been very paranoid about being, because I'm not a member of the band, of, of being not let in. So, uh, and I tend to be in the nervous looking types at times. So what happened was I went and worked all afternoon making measurements before the people came. And then I left my equipment on the stage and then I went to lunch, to dinner. And then the band was gonna play, you know, their regular stuff. And what happened was the, uh, uh, when I came back, some guy wouldn't let me in. And I said, well, I've got the bumper sticker and I got the password and I got, you know, and the guy says, I don't care who you, you know, I don't know you. So Bill Graham's walking by. Now I just had talked to Bill Graham uh, an hour before because we worked on a movie. It's called the Bill Graham week. Well, it was almost, we used to call it the Bill Graham movie. It was, it was the Fillmore, the last days of the film. Oh, you worked on that? Cool. Yeah, I worked on that. So I was a sound guy for that. So what happened is I asked Bill about the, you know, how it was going and all. So he knew me even from that day, because I used to be able to, you know, we worked together. So Bill Grams walks by, just to give you an idea how immature this culture was. And this guy has got his foot in front, uh, literally stopping me from going forward my stuff's on the stage and uh he uh i said bill will you tell this guy i'm okay and bill graham didn't even acknowledge me he just walked by mm -hmm. so i said to the guy because the guy said oh well you can go now i said why are you letting me in now he says well he would have said something in a negative way if you weren't allowed <laughs> I think, oh man, what a joke, you know? I don't need <laughs> That's such a great <laughs> one of those oh, then, my test equipment. I have my calculator, you know, HP 35, which is brand new, you know, $400 calculator on the stage. I mean, I was a little nervous about, you know, what the heck do I have to do? That is such great inverse logic right there. He didn't say anything negative, so you can go on in. What the yeah, hell? right, right. <laughs> Never exactly. trust a prankster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's the point of all this? And um, so it happened later uh, with the Bill Graham group. Uh, he trained his people very much the same way. And uh, we were doing the Watkins Glen thing. Uh, with 500,000 people and all. And it's a serious deal getting in and out of that thing. And we hired a bunch of the Mark Levinson guys. Can you imagine some of the guys who actually built the Mark Levinson equipment? We, they were invited, to, unpaid, to work for the Grateful Dead. You know, we, we did things like I was the pit crew guy, you know, I was the boss. And we would dig ditches, you know, for laying the cables out to the mixing you know, stand out in the, you know, in the middle of the audience and that sort of thing. And uh, these, the, the night before the, 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 the event, they changed the badges on us. Didn't say anything to anybody. <laughs> I had to go and go in there, get badges, not only for me, but for my guys. 
and then um, we all got our badges, and then you know, and then then uh, we're on the stage, and everybody's you know having a you know that thing. One of the guys it has the badges; he has the right badge, and he's working with the left, but they don't recognize him. Some guy from Fillmore group don't recognize him, so they throw him out in the audience, take away his badge, and throw him out in the middle of the audience. Well, he's with us, you know. I mean. <laughs> We're the ones that are responsible for him. So the poor guy, you know, he's freaked out. Just nonsense stuff. Stuff that you don't, it's not necessary to I run a show. It's not necessary. What's the point of messing with people if it, I mean, you know, but people, there are people who just do that for the fun of doing it. I heard stories of one time the crew sent some runner out to buy fishing poles for all the Grateful Dead crew so they could cast their lines off the back of the stage and bother people. I mean, it's just- <laughs> I can't you know, believe it. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. stuff was, like were there that. delay towers at Watkins Glen? Yes, there were. There were two sets of other um, companies. Flair Brothers was one, and I don't remember the other one. We put them on a delay line the first of the delay lines, the even tide uh, delay lines. They were pretty crude, but we did have delay lines. Yeah, because so we couldn't do it all the distance and set the delay time. Yeah, we yeah, it's easy enough to do. Did they work? Yeah, well, within the realm of reason, I guess. I never went out there to listen, so I don't know. But they, you know, they were there. There were towers. So far as I know, it worked. Right. Leslie, That's how are we doing? The, you know, it's like it's like Woodstock. If you remember the pictures of Woodstock, I mean, you just can't get around. You know, you just can't just well walking around. You know, it's kind of kind of tight. You know, with everybody and his brother there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. But you know, there were other events. It's it's too bad uh, uh, with the wall of sound. I I thought it was. A fairly successful thing, but it was heavy, and uh, it took a lot of work. All right, this is an, a, an interesting question. How how would you implement the wall of sound today? Would it be is it practical to do it today? Are the speakers just is is everything are, like are the amplifiers any lighter weight now? Are the speakers any more efficient now? Could you implement the wall of sound now? It wouldn't be much different because the, the amplifiers are a little more powerful uh, because they can make switching amps for the bass now, which are much more efficient, you know, and uh, can be, uh, and lighter. Uh, but the um, speaker cabinets and everything, they're, they, they're heavy things, you know? I mean, they, they just, it's, if you, if you don't want them to rattle or, or do something or fall apart when you, like most of the Grateful Dead stuff was made, not necessarily for resonance per se, but for rugged ability. So you, you could dro accidentally drop it, not have it shatter. You know, it's like heavy duty furniture. Um, and um, it just so happened that it was so hard. We pres presume we had it pretty well uh, non-resonant, but that wasn't really so. What happens is, is that as you, stiffen the, or use a stronger and stronger material, it just raises the frequency of the resonance. It doesn't really change the cue. So interesting enough to actually do a high fidelity kind of uh, speaker cabinet, you have to actually have different materials fighting each other internally so that they turn the, the vibration into heat. It can't just be in one piece you know, uh, of material, no matter if it's steel or or if it's wood. And, and then what do you do with that heat? Well, the heat just isn't that much, you know. He just dissipates through the wood. It would probably, you could measure with a thermometer, I guess. It just, uh, um, but it's hard to make a, a speaker cabinet that's that's lightweight and, uh, and doesn't, uh, resonate and throw out a whole lot of extra stuff uh, through the sides of the cabinet. You, you know, high fidelity people do it all the time, try to do it all the time. They never do it perfectly. 
even the best, the Wilson Audio, for example, they work real hard at that. But they're now, they don't do perfect design, they're perfect, even though they develop their own materials and everything. The Grateful Dead just used 15 ply birch, which is pretty good stuff, but it, it definitely has a resonance. How do you compensate for the resonance? You don't. You just you learn to live with it. It's a part of the Grateful Dead sound, I think. And what, what, how does it, how is it manifested? What would I see on a curve if I was looking at that? Well, I don't know. I guess if you, uh, I, I don't know. I've never tried to measure it. You have to measure from the side, if not from the front, but from the side of the cabinet. You'd have to use an accelerometer or something and put it on the side of the cabinet. And then when you step, you went through the sweep, you'd find some place where the cabinet would start to sing. Interesting. Well, but how, does that, how does that manifest in the audio result? Well, it'll actually, the cabinets themselves will be vibrating and they'll act like little miniature, I mean, like not miniature, but a fairly wide area, but, uh, you know, loudspeaker, they'll actually add to the sound. And, but I'm asking what, what happens to what's coming out the front of the speakers? Is that the energy that's going into the vibrations is it taken out of the audio program, right? So Not there's a notch it's or something? Back wave, anyway. It's just a back sorry? wave. I'm sorry, say again? That, that normally you have some absorption material in the cabinet just to kind of tone it down. But the back wave is not considered a part of the, the part that you really care much, much, much about. Okay, you're, you've just reached the edges of my expertise on these things and I no longer understand what you're saying. They, they, weren't, they weren't ported cabinets, you know, they were just uh, boxes, they were just sealed boxes. So we were pretty, look, we were pretty rudimentary in those days. I mean, considering everything. You know, making a sealed cabinet was a lot easier than building a ported cabinet properly. Cabinet, ported cabinets are always tough. All I can tell you, man, is that I got to see that PA system about a dozen times that year, and it was unbelievable. So good. Such a great sound. And everywhere, I mentioned the, yeah. the day I walked on the and back of the, the In the base, you know. Where, where it didn't hurt your ears, but boy, it, it moved your body. Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, it was loud down there, down it, low. It, it, it also matters that it was the, the, an amazingly great edition of the Grateful Dead with all those guys playing at peak gestalt magic and all their instrument sounds were really clear and there was only one drummer and there wasn't 16 layers of string pads and stuff. It was just an amazingly articulate band playing through this amazingly articulate system. Yeah, well, it was better than most of the systems that were available, uh, not all the systems that were available that we knew of. I mean, we really did throw money at it. I mean, money was thrown at it and we used the best speakers that we could reasonably use. It, it should also be noted, I think, that other uh, bands, touring bands did not adopt this technology and go out on the road with giant walls of sound, which probably tells us something about the economics of it as well as the science and everything else of it. No, no, it wasn't. Um, they are, well, they did other things like uh, Pink Floyd would do what quadraphonic or quadraphenia kind of stuff. They do different things that so they have sound systems all over. I worked with the, uh, the Floyd for a while too, back in er, before the Grateful Dead or in between when I worked. Oh, with say them. more. Well, I, I didn't do a whole lot with them, but they, they basically had the more steady, the horn loaded system, you know, and they used phase linear amplifiers and, and uh, you know, phase linear 700s. And um, they, they blow them up all the time, but they were very inexpensive. They had their own guy to repair them. And uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, they were more conventional. Did they use that quad system to do spatial manipulations? I presume so. I didn't attend a performance oh. directly. I was just working with the roadies, with the with the sound crew. I see. I remember hearing that they would do things like wire up a grid of speakers on the ceiling of a venue so they could have footsteps walking across. But I never. Well, they, heard could. they they. I remember talking to one of the guys back in 1970 of all times and. He, he, they had a little, you know, they had like a little um, joystick thing, you know, and all that. They could do different effects. 
The Grateful I thought Dead it was... had a little joystick system in the early '80s. I remember at the a couple of times in like '83 or '84, maybe. Uh, Healy had some speakers in the back of the room, and I remember watching Sam Sam Katuri, Phil Katuri's kid, playing with a joystick and sending sound around the building. Um, I don't know how many uh, tours they used that for, whether they only used it for local stuff, but it was it made for a, a, some really trippy shit in the uh, drums and space. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's more what the those the you know. Uh, the guy, the wall of sound was a departure from the normal, and it was Bear's idea that to, to insistence to try to do it. We didn't know. I didn't even know if it would work. Really, we weren't sure if it would work. We just knew that well, you know, Bear wants to do it. Okay, we'll do it. It worked. I'm here to tell you. Uh, Alex wants to know about the best recordings that capture the wall of sound. A lot of the stuff that was released. Kid Candelario made soundboard recordings. You know, he got his own split from the system and made um, stereo recordings that don't really, they're, I mean, they're great sounding recordings, um, but they don't really give you a sense of what the wall of sound sounded like. A gentleman by the name of Jerry Moore very famously made uh, tapes in June of 74 at the Miami Highlight that I would recommend. There are tons of stuff are available on archive.org. In the audio section of archive.org, there's a separate tab for the Grateful Dead. And there are literally thousands of recordings of the Grateful Dead available on that archive. And I would look for the search terms of, for Jerry Moore in 1974 in particular, and, and look for some of his recordings because he was very, very good at his job using reasonably good equipment for the day. And I would particularly recommend June 23rd, 1974 at Miami, which is a terrific show and a really, really great stereo recording made from the house of that system in action. I don't have any records of it now. Um, in fact, uh, I used to record from the Grateful Dead uh, the same way as Kid, uh, same, same out, uh, outlet. And uh, Kid used... Um, uh, Sony tape recorder and running at seven and a half inches per second uh, that um, was made, it was basically for the band. It, the, the, in other words, what we did, I mean, I even helped, you know, we, we'd flip the, the, the tapes or change the tapes when they needed to be changed. Ran seven and a half because it wasn't really, it wasn't expected to ever be used. It was only for monitoring the quality of the band. And it came off the, you know, the PA basically, but, but the deal is, is that uh, it wasn't, um, uh, it was only, it was full track, I mean, a half track, it was yeah. uh, seven and a half inches, but half track. So I have to say that considering he was likely mixing on headphones, Kid did a pretty damn good job of putting together a stereo mix while doing the rest of his, his job on stage. Well, I don't know. You know, you just sat there. No, really and truly, it was the mix was for the the room. I think I'm pretty sure, and whatever came out of that just got into the feed. I mean, as far as I know, the the tape recorder did the work. You know, the um, the Sony tape recorder. I mean, I was there. You know, literally next to it for a long, a lot of times. And it just did, it was just a logging recorder almost. In yeah. fact, it surprises me today. See, that's the problem with the Grateful Dead sound is they don't really have that much of the real mastering stuff, the real 16 channel, uh, you know, and all that uh, mastering stuff from the Grateful Dead done properly. Because well, fortunately for them, they've developed an audience that is uh, perfectly willing to accept the sound reinforcement recordings and, and pay good money for them. So they're doing OK. I, um, I love the recording that was done before my time, which was done by Bear and, and, and uh, maybe, uh, you know, and uh, was uh, called Live Dead. And that was uh, done with the, uh, their, their the 16 channel tape recorder, but it was, uh, it is the cleanest version I've ever heard. Yeah, of that was recorded by Bob and Betty. And my Bob and Betty. 
My understanding was that Wickersham sort of uh, spirited that first two inch machine out of MPEG so they could uh, hump it up the stairs at the Avalon and make that recording. Possible. Uh, and that, that it was well, literally like, buying, you know, sorry? I don't know. If, I don't know if he could steal it. it. It was one of the first machines. Well, I think he just borrowed it for them for some, or something like that. that that's I'm, I'm semi remembering a legend about that. That's but possible. He, but yeah. Betty, Betty had very good ears. Bob and Betty, uh, Bob, Bob, uh, I worked for Bob and and then and, uh, and Betty as well, and uh, with Olympic, they were part of Olympic. And uh, Bob, Betty had really good ears. Betty could could do. I, if Betty did a recording, I'd, I'd I'd listen to it seriously. You know where to place the mics for sure. That but that these stories are told by the way in my book. This is all a dream we dreamed, an oral history of the Grateful Dead. I have to work a little. Uh, plug in there. Matthews told me the story of, of how they kind of did the mix for Live Dead on their own dime and presented it to the band, which approved it. But Bob and Betty <laughs> kind of did it. The, the, the band had either like not completed it or had not come to a satisfying mix or whatever. So Bob uh, uh, traded some work for some studio time and they did the mix on their own and handed it to the band and the band went, oh, that'll do. Yes. That's good. Yeah, I can believe that. Um, you know, I can believe that that was like, I, I was, it was a little bit before I started with them that they did that. But I, I, I still have that album and I think it's my reference album for them. I'll put it on yeah. electrostatic headphones or something and it's that good quality. So, uh, but a lot of the other ones, you know, they little people's cassette recorders and, and the seven and a half ips, uh, Sony, you know, and all that. And that's, that's a sad thing. Very little, really high quality recordings. Apparently. Yeah, from the audiophile standpoint, you have a great point. But on the other hand, there's just tons and tons of happy people out there enjoying those half-assed recordings. So what are we gonna do? Oh, yeah, I like them too. Yeah, me too. I, I play them on the radio for a living, so, you know. I had them uh, before the firestorm. I had a firestorm and wiped out all my tapes. Oh, but sorry. I used to have a lot of those tapes, you know, of the dead and other groups too, new writers and others. Um, and they are all lost, you know. They were all 15 nips, half track, master type. No, 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 I'm really sorry you lost all that stuff. Yes, I am too, but <laughs> that's life. You know, you can't get it back. Yeah. So, so how are we doing, everybody? Anybody got any questions? Have I uh, any comments? A uh, quick question: When they went to the Meyer Sound uh, system, the I guess Ultrasound was the company that ran it for them. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that Meyer Sound was using uh, an EQ'd mid-range driver for the high end. Is that correct? I don't know. Okay. I don't know either. David, could you talk a little bit about how you got into being the Grateful Dead encyclopedia that you are and about your Grateful Dead hour and your radio broadcasts and, and your music? Oh, I'd be happy to give you a short version of that. <laughs> um, I, I was a, a young singer songwriter in San Jose when my songwriting partner finally talked me into going to see the Grateful Dead, which I didn't think I was going to like because they had songs with names like Boogie and Blues in them. And I was sort of a folk rock singer songwriter type. We took uh, what proved to be a extremely strong dose of LSD and jumped in a car and drove to San Francisco and got there late and wound up in the last row at Winterland on March 5th, 1972 but various little bits of music etched themselves in my mind. And when I recovered what was left of my mind and started listening to that stuff, I figured out there was some really interesting music that absolutely exploded my sense of what songwriting is and got me on a path that eventually led me to understand what was going on in those long instrumental passages and thus turned me into an improvisational musician. And in 76, I started writing for music magazines basically as an excuse to get uh, free records and concert tickets and stuff. And by the way, to meet people. And that's how I got to interview Leo Fender and George Fullerton in their factory and Ted Templeman in his office and John Meyer in his office and 
and uh, Les Paul at the old Waldorf. And I was off and running as a journalist, learning and, and meeting people and stuff. And I started doing stuff about the Grateful Dead. I started at BAM Magazine in 76. They sent me off to interview Bob Weir in August of 77 and Robert Hunter in November of 77. And in 81, I interviewed Phil Lesh. So over time, I just did journalism on the Grateful Dead and became friendly with various uh, people and started hanging out with Weir and Lesh a little bit socially. And that led to greater opportunities and a press junket to Jamaica led to my being invited to do a book with Peter Simon, which became playing in the band, an oral and visual portrait of the Grateful Dead. Um, yeah, an oral and visual portrait of the Grateful Dead. And that led to my accidentally becoming, a, being a guest on a radio show and then becoming the host of that radio show, the KFOG Deadhead Hour, because I had tapes and I basically knew how to do audio reasonably well. And I had just published a book on the subject, so I had lots of knowledge and connections. Plus, the Grateful Dead let me into the vault. When I started doing the KFOG Deadhead Hour, they basically said, go in the vault and get tapes if you want to. So I started getting tapes out of the vault and doing stuff. And so literally without ever making a plan or having any serious ambitions, these opportunities opened themselves up in front of me and I followed them into what turned out to be a highly enjoyable career as a journalist um, while also doing my own music all along, writing songs and recording along the way. And I literally made no plans to do any of this stuff. I started doing the KFOG Deadhead Hour and other radio stations called and asked if they could carry the show. So I inadvertently became a, a syndicated radio host. And, and then when in 2007, when the Sirius uh, satellite radio signed a contract to um, do a Grateful Dead channel. The Grateful Dead asked them to hire me to consult in, on the creation of that channel. So that's been uh, another job of mine since 2007. And we do a weekly call-in show on Sunday afternoons, Gary Lambert and I. So I, I literally just watched doors open in front of me and was smart enough to go through them and wound up having this incredibly happy, enjoyable, satisfying life as an expert on the Grateful Dead while also writing, composing and performing and recording music of my own all these years. So I'm a happy camper in front of you and I have basically very little idea how exactly I got here. What amazes me is that the Grateful Dead are still a well-known uh, item after 20 years after Jerry's death, or tw was it 25 years now? Yeah. Jerry's, I mean, it's a long time, and yet well, they, they did something very, very compelling, as you know. I mean, look how many how how many scientists and artists have drawn inspiration from the Grateful Dead and gone on to do amazing things, and politicians too, and and people. But Steve Silberman, who's a very, very, very well known writer now, wrote a tremendous book on autism called Neuro Tribes a couple of years ago. Steve uh, was also a big deadhead. And the way he put it in an interview with me once was, look, I didn't set out to become a deadhead. I just went to a show. And then I went to another show. And then I went to another show. And the next thing you know, it's 15 years later. And all of my friends are people that I know through going to the Grateful Dead. They built up a culture by doing something that people found irresistible and found um, ongoing engagement with. The sociologists and musicologists have noted the Grateful Dead by not playing the song the same way twice and by having their recordings leak out into the world, they, they created a culture with its own uh, beautiful calling card that drew people into it. So trading tapes became a re recruitment mechanism for people coming to the shows. And, and, they're, and all the guys in the band that are still alive are still making great music. Bob, we are still making really, really good music with the Wolf Bros and people are watching and listening and, and, and and going to those shows. So they did something that was incredibly attractive and continued doing it and kept themselves interested through that 30 year career by keeping each other interested, which kept us all interested. And by leaving behind this tremendous legacy of recorded product, which they've fairly wisely exploited over the years, they, they built themselves a culture that 
they can it's actually sustainable and is still growing i i also go out in the country and play music with young musicians in their 20s and 30s who could not possibly have seen jerry play live but are deeply and profoundly fluent in that musical language it took on a life of its own Oh, a question came through. Did John work with any groups beside the Dead and Floyd? Can you share some stories? No, <laughs> I mean, not really. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I moved around. Uh, I, um, uh, John Meyer and I went to Switzerland. We actually worked with the, um, a classical musical, um, classical music institute. So we actually had a big change in our our uh, venue, you know, we, we were with classical musicians for several years and I married one of them. So, you know, it's like, um, I like classical musicians. They're more refined in certain ways. And um, they, uh, um, I get along with them better, to be honest with you, me personally. Uh -huh. uh, John, um, went back he's always been in the pa venue business so he he worked with a lot of bands a lot of groups and but i i didn't uh i worked with uh, recording groups like mobile fidelity crystal clear recordings um dave wilson uh i made a lot of their recording equipment so uh you know designed the electronics but i, I rarely went uh one time uh, we had a shoot off with uh, uh, Fleetwood Mac, with my new I knew tape recorder I was working on, and uh, they decided they didn't like my tape recorder, and so they used the digital version uh, for the final mix of Tusk. If you know, you know the yeah, the, and uh, they didn't use our uh, uh, Mobile Fidelity used the the uh, analog version, which we did thirty inches per second. Um, it, uh, it was a new technology, uh, the digital at the time, and they thought that it would not wear out as quickly as the um, analog recordings that they had made before uh, when they were making uh, uh, records. They, they tended to wear out the, uh, the dub masters or whatever they call them, the ones that, that they're uh, recorded, uh, you know, sub recorded from them, the true masters. And then they, they would wear them out just uh, trying to make records with them. And um, they thought that uh, digital would give them a, a better life. But I heard the difference in the sound. Uh, digital at that time was not quite there. And um, so us didn't do as well as the previous album, which was done all analog. Yeah, that, that record, at least my vinyl copy, is not enjoyable to listen to from an audio standpoint. If you like the songs, it's one thing, but the sound quality is harsh and brittle and it's- uh... It's the digital, man. <laughs> and you know what? I heard it, I heard the masters, you know, I mean, the whole thing from the, you know, mixed down, it was glorious. And they decided they didn't want to use it. They wanted to go to the digital. They were in, in, enamored. The band was enamored with the, the digital idea of mystique. So many people in those days, around 1980, made that mistake. Singers, you know, you get a singer who she might become famous with an analog recording and then she goes to a digital recording and it's not the same. Anymore. Oh God, you just made me remember seeing Elliot Mazur had that Mitsubishi 32 track over at Fantasy. <laughs> uh, that, that machine didn't last very long, did it? You know, I never saw his machine. Uh, I did, we designed, uh, 1980, we designed a mixing board for Elliot Mazur. And Elliot decided he didn't really want to use it anymore. So he gave it to the Stanford, uh, was it CCC? Karma? No, yeah, Karma. Karma. CCRMA. And uh, they used it. And uh, the interesting thing was, is that uh, 
they would take it out on, on shootouts or, or AB comparisons. And Sony decided to ban the, the thing because it sounded too clear and they it embarrassed them. So they, <laughs> they I, it was an all discreet design. So they actually, Kermit, Kermit gave it back to me. I actually own the thing now. And uh, they gave me the board. When the board became unreliable and they decided it was just too hard to keep it running, they gave it back to me just for free. And I offered it to Elliot but he would take it sort of, but then I thought, well, you know, we could improve it, Elliot, you know, I could do this to that and that and that. And then it started getting expensive. And then, then Elliot said, no, forget it. Where is it now? It's in storage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a sad thing. You know, it's good. It's a good, you know, all discreet design. Uh, I used to design for Crystal Clear and and, and, uh, I, I'm oh. guessing there's some super rich hobbyist who would buy it from you and restore it and use it for his own private recordings once or twice a year. Oh, that'd be nice. I'd be glad. <laughs> <to talk. laughs> yeah. Well, it, it would be really worthwhile for somebody, but you know, that's the. I always thought I'd do something. I'm just too lazy to do something like that. Re completely refurbish it. If I could get younger people in the, involved in this business who really had a lot of extra energy, it'd be great because I'd, I'd give them, I'd just stick them to, you know, here, you know, do this, do that to it. But, uh, you know, they don't, they don't happen anymore that I can find. So if anybody knows anybody who's like that, you know, send them my way. Yeah, they can contact us or David at his website or we'll put them in touch with you, John. Oh, that'd be wonderful because, you know, it's, it's getting new blood in this industry is hard. Nobody, see, you know, they they don't seem to want to learn buggy whip manufacturer or whatever we did back in the day, the old the old ways. You know, so. Well, yeah, in, but, in the in the weird little Grateful Dead music universe, I one of the things on Facebook there's a Grateful Dead musicians discussion page, and it is just loaded with people obsessing over capacitor values on Jerry's guitar and things like that. And they want, there's all these guys that have spent vast amounts of money getting exact duplicates built of Jerry's instruments and stuff. And they want to just make sure that the, you know, what tone did he use on his quack filter or what settings, you know, it's like the obsession with that kind of stuff. So there Jerry, are, sorry? Jerry, I don't think was as, as obsessed as, as, let's say Phil or somebody else, I mean, with the fancy equipment, Jerry play anything. It seems to me. Yeah. See, I, I'm the. I just. I, I'm. I'm more interested in the notes that are being played rather than the tool that's being used to well, play them. And I just don't geek out on this stuff. I. I and I. It's. I don't. I, I. It's not that I don't understand and appreciate it, and I really obviously benefit tremendously from other people's obsessions with these things. Um. But I think what I think what I the reason I brought it up was that there there are people that are interested in this stuff on it for its own sake. I guess you just have to find the one that would be interested in taking on that console as a project. Well, it depends. See, music production and high fidelity reproduction are two different things, really. High fidelity reproduction, you want it as clean and as clear as possible with uh, musical production like uh, guitar amps and things like that, you don't want necessarily the clearest and the cleanest, but you want, you want it to work. You don't want it to just, you know, sound awful. So um, for example, Alembic, what, what Alembic did was basically stole the Fender amplifier preamp from the Grateful Dead. I mean, the Grateful Dead's unit, see they used to build them as complete Con, you know, with speakers and everything. And they would just take the preamp part out and then put their own power amps and speakers on. And uh, they did that for the dead for many years. And then what they did was they copied wire for wire, um, a capacitor for capacitor. It's like you said, the, the uh, uh, fender preamp and made a few small modifications that were just engineering improvements. And uh, I've got one in the other room. I mean, I play it with my Fender, you know, 
And it sounds so much better than just running through a linear amplifier. You can't run it through a linear preamplifier and make it sounds flat and 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 lifeless. I mean, a Fender will do that. Stratocaster sounds lifeless through a, a regular preamp. I understand that you don't it's a completely run stuff. different world. Yeah. Well, I have the my my working instrument is uh, a, a Rick Turner design. Oh yeah, Rick. Uh, I know Rick, of course. Uh, uh, it's an unbelievable instrument. It's uh, just a peak of of everything, as far as I'm concerned. It's got it's a one of those sealed chamber uh, stage acoustics, you know, with his beautiful piezo pickup on it. But there's also a magnetic pickup on it and a stereo preamp. And I just keep the blend pot set in the middle so that whenever I'm playing, I'm getting both the benefits and articulation of an acoustic and the color warmth and distortion of an electric. And it's like the most amazing instrument for solo performance that I, I, I could imagine. I, I, I just feel so amazingly blessed to have an instrument with that range. But it, it, it Rick, because, it so I go. Did did Rick make his own piezo pickup? I'm pretty sure. I mean, he kind of invented that uh, that use use of that technology for guitars, no. didn't he? No. No. Uh, another guy did who we, we used to work with, and that's why I'm surprised that maybe Rick took took some of his ideas. Um, there was another company that made piezo pickups for. Uh, all kinds of instruments. Okay, I, I, I'm not that clear on the history. I just know that this instrument was designed from the ground up to, to be what it is. And it's just, it, it, it has such a great sound uh, when you plug it in and just play off the, the acoustic. It's, it's, and then you add the ability to play an electric guitar simultaneously. There's just nothing like it. Right. Anyway, I just wanted to in, interject a rave about Rick Turner's genius well, Rick is an Olympic guy. alumni and he he yeah I worked alongside of Rick for years I mean you know we, we worked in the same place together Rick's a nice guy too very much and, so uh, he, yes he, Jay he, that's he, the he, Lindsay Buckingham he's more refined than some of the other other characters say uh, again you know. he's more refined you know refined as an individual yeah. kinder yeah. nicer more polite well you know I, he I bought my first guitar from him in 1981, and I've been friends with him ever since. And and uh, I take my instrument down there to his shop for maintenance once or twice a year, really? so we catch up and have lunch. He is a wonderful guy, and a, not a shabby musician himself. One of the things he does, he he's a he plays the ook. He builds beautiful ooks, and he plays in a band called Ook Ellington. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. No, but I, I do know, you know, no, he, he worked on my, I had a little 12 string, a Mexican 12 string. He put a bar in the neck. It was starting to bend. And he, he, he you know, uh, he, he did things for me as well. And uh, the, uh, yeah, he, he was a, uh, he's a good guy. I, I still have him on Facebook. Dick. You probably do. And that's, that's, but I, I, we don't, we talk once in a while on the phone. But we're, we're so far away from each other now, uh, commercially, that, that uh, we don't have that much to share. There's a question for uh, you, David, I think, uh, from Jay asking if this is the same guitar that Lindsey Buckingham plays. Yes, I already answered that on uh, over the air here. Um, it, it, Jay, uh, Lindsey was, uh, is Rick Turner's most uh, high profile customer, it's true. And he plays, he usually goes on tour with like a dozen of these instruments. The original, the electric uh, is called the Model One and that's the, the one that Lindsey's most well known for. This RS6 thing that I'm talking about is a hybrid guitar. It's functions more, you know, it's not purely an electric. It's like a stage acoustic and it's a wonderful, wonderful instrument. It's one of those things, it's like, I don't understand why everybody doesn't own one. It's so, it, it, it so it solves the problem of playing an acoustic guitar in a high um, sound environment. You can take, play it on a stage with a horn band and it won't feed back. And, and it just sounds amazingly good because, because it's Rick. So the wood and the shape and the structure of it and the materials and everything about it 
is thought out and realized beautifully because it's Rick Turner who has just an amazing ear, eye, and heart. Are there any other questions? I can't, you know, uh, on this end, I'm not really familiar with it. I keep seeing chat. Is that something that matters to us? We can on that, but nothing, no, we, we've answered anything that's come through so far. Oh, okay. I see what came up. I wasn't sure what would happen to block everything out or what. Any further comments or questions? I'm kind of starting to run into my uh, prep time for my live show, which starts in an hour and 20 minutes, but I can, Stay for a little while longer. Quick question: The modification did did um, Turner do the modifications to uh, Jerry Garcia's Alligator guitar? I believe so. Okay. He just got it. There's a guy uh, who's who's been buying up these instruments and getting them restored, and he bought that Alligator guitar. He brought it. I, he brought it to KPFA in February of 2020. He brought it to KPFA during my marathon. Oh, and I got my picture taken with it. And he also had a, an acoustic, a D28, and I got to play a song live on the air with it. But that, <laughs> that guitar had been restored by Rick. And he, and he took it over to the Fillmore that night. And Jeff Matson of the Dark Star Orchestra played it live on stage. Wow. So this guy named Andy Logan, who I don't know where his money comes from, but he's been buying up these guitars and sharing them with ins with the players. So all these Grateful Dead, these Jerry Garcia guitar player guys get to play Jerry instruments on stage because of this philanthropist named Andy who's been sharing them. It's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Was it was it dream was it all that you dreamed it could be holding Jerry's guitar? You know, I'm not as as much of a fetishist about that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I to to me, in fact, I, I have this this conversation with Logan about it. I I'm have never in my life been interested in sounding like somebody else. There's a lot of Jerry Garcia in my guitar playing. There's a lot of Bob Weir in my guitar playing, and there's a lot of other guys in my guitar playing because I started out as a songwriter first. You know, not I didn't want to like play the guitar and then learn how to do other stuff. I came in it as a storyteller and songwriter first and, and acquired the interest in the instrument itself and stuff like that. But I've never been that obsessed with it. I, when I interviewed Jerry in 81, he took me down to his apartment and, and, and into his closet and I got to actually hold whichever the guitar was that he was playing in those days, which by the way, was insanely heavy ridiculously heavy solid body guitar whatever it was that jerry was playing but i've just it's to me it's never been about the instrument it's been about the player i jerry as john said earlier jerry would play anything and jerry could make great things happen with anything his primary working acoustic in his last years was a takamine you know a completely nondescript takamine but he he could make magic happen regardless of the instrument yeah he really was special we used to listen to him. The band, one of the things behind the wall of sound, which you wouldn't normally notice, is that there, Jerry would play with open back cabinets, and we'd put them inside the wall of sound so that they basically wouldn't come cancel themselves out. But they were open back because it sounds better or the response is different than a, a sealed cabinet. And we, the road and the roadies, would go back behind the wall of sound. And we would listen to Jerry pick because that would make him stand out over the whole band. We'd rather have listen to him than anybody else. So we used to do that. Why well, you could mix see. yourself just by walking away from the amp, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so great because the open back cabinet would give us the exact right, you know, just like it was coming out of Jerry Garcia. And the rest of the band was a little bit farther away because it was all going, yeah, the sound was all going in the opposite direction. There, there are deadheads that would trade anything to be able to experience what you experienced in that That's moment. That's right, but we, we all, the, the roadies know, you know, roadies and me, I mean, I was just there, but I was, the roadies know, you know, people know when it's right. 